his computer. All right, one more minute to go. Cool. So where are you exactly? Uh, Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, not too so far not away. Far. No, not too far. No. no, just trying to space out my trips, you know. Yeah. So I'm not at too many barns in one day and all the disinfecting and, you know, mm. <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot to prevent all the cross-contamination. Yeah, fun times. Yeah, the new normal. Yeah. But it's very workable, you know. It's not bad. Well, yeah, because it's not like you're around hordes of people. Like, I can't teach because... Right. They're groups. Know. Yeah. And, well, yeah. just sticking my hands on people. <laughs> yeah, right. That's, that's a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. Bad idea yeah. right now, so... Yeah, no, I really don't touch people. I touch horses' hooves, and that's it. Yeah, right. And so that's the thing is... Um, uh, I, you know, I'm exploring all this, all this kind of stuff, the Zoom meetings and just, uh, and, and actually I'm getting a lot of stuff. Well, I'm still trying to catch up from traveling so much last year. I'm still working on the workbook for Surefoot, which is really a awesome. good project. Okay. Yeah. So it looks like it's one o'clock. We'll just okay. go ahead and get started. Um, okay. Hi, I'm Wendy Murdoch. And today my guest is Daisy Bicking. Um, Daisy, I met you in Pennsylvania. Um, but I can't remember what year that was. Long time ago. It was back when you had, um, not, who, who was your gray era? Windsy? Windy. 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 Yes. Great. Yes. It probably would have been, oh, 2000 and I want to say, how old was Rowan? There we go. She was just no, Well, Rowan Pennsylvania. was, remember you brought Rowan down to Virginia, um, to yeah. Pam's place, and she was tiny. Everything's by Rowan. So, so what year did you have Rowan? 2009. So probably 2008. Uh, well, no, this did was, you, did we meet before or after you got pregnant? Uh, that's a really good question. Okay. Probably okay. after. Pro Ro I think Rowan was itty bitty because when I was at Sue's, she was, her first ride was on one of Sue's horses when she was okay. like eight weeks old. Oh, okay. All right. So well, I don't use That does before. our time right. call it. Since you had Rowan, 2008, so that's 12 yeah. years. Um, and Daisy, you weren't actually, you hadn't been a, a barefoot trimmer that long when I met you. You used to be a used car, not a used car salesman. But <laughs> Oh my gosh, throw me under the bus, Wendy. Um, no, I, I've actually been a farrier for 16 years. Okay. So I was so, a farrier at the time, uh, yeah. not as long as now. Um, and then I did sell cars before being a farrier. I sold Saturns. So it was the don't exist fuzzy, anymore. <laughs> the warm, fuzzy company, you know, all customer service, no hassle, no haggle. So I learned a lot about customer service and about running a business by doing that. So, um, so yeah, so we met, I met Daisy and at the time I was uh, working with her on her riding because you were wanting to do dressage and then you went into endurance and you did a bunch of things. But in the meantime, you taught me how to trim my horse's feet. Yeah. Do you remember? Yes, that was fun. Yeah, so Daisy mm -hmm. came down and trimmed, taught me how to trim my horses, and I've been doing them pretty much ever since, except when I'm like not home or when I had surgery, I gave it up for a while. <laughs> right, that's a good reason. You know, after surgery, because I couldn't really hold a foot. Um, but I still um, think of you every time, and uh, it's been really, really valuable working with you and having that feedback and feeling like I can do this myself. And, um, and you weren't there a lot to help me. I mean, it was, a couple of times so yeah. you know but it was really great information so that i could trim my horse myself so what i'd like to do to start with daisy if, is have you just kind of give everybody like a hoof 101 intro okay and kind of just sure. just to make sure that everybody's up to speed um on some hoof anatomy and some basics and then we're gonna go jump off from there okay sure so um do you want to um, we need to make your screen bigger, which was, I don't remember how to do that. Make my screen. Like, yeah. Like you're tiny screen. right now. Oh, um, um, let's see here. If I say, if I say pin video or spotlight video, 
Spotlight. I've forgotten how to. Oh, there you go. Perfect. Yay. Oh. There we go. That's much I love, better. <laughs> I love it when things work out really well, right? So I thought what I could do is just do a little bit of one of the more basic, um, you know, workshop presentations that I like to use, um, where it kind of goes just into some some basic concepts to start us out. So I'm just grabbing the right one here. Um, let's see. Because there's so many different trim styles and there's so many different ideas about trimming and about what we do to the horse's foot that it can be really, really difficult to, um, you know, to know where to go and what to do. Right. And um, of course, I'm not finding the one I want at the moment, which always That's drives okay. me crazy. <laughs> right? Always. Um, so let's see here. Let's just do this one. change my mind on which one I wanted to use Wendy sorry that's fine it's no problem well thank you I appreciate that yeah. um so yeah so you know what is, what is this here 2020 there we go you got it there we go okay Good. now here your screen share okay so we can All see right. it yeah go in there right now okay this is Daisy's first Zoom meeting, right, Daisy? First one that I'm not watching. Yeah, that I'm actually <laughs> participating in, right? Okay. So can you all see that? Yep. Okay. And let me go to, got that in the wrong place. Let's go play. There we go. Okay. So, you know, all these different trim styles, sometimes it's really hard to know exactly what's right and what's wrong and what's good and what's bad. So for me, I tend to skip thinking in those terms and just think about what's functional for the horse and how can I keep everything as healthy as possible. And really that gets into some biomechanics because we all have different things we like about different styles of feet. You know, some people like a bigger roll. Some people like to, to leave flare dishing. Some when you like, talk about a roll or a flare, tell us what you're talking about. So that would be like the bevel on the edge of the foot there you see on the black and white foot on the right is that big round like yep. I think you, you can use your pointer too. Oh, I can? I, don't I think have a so. Player. I hit play. Give it a shot. No I don't have a pointer. Okay no worries. Okay. So um so yeah so you know the the foot needs to make a solid connection to the ground for the horse. It's what the horse stands on to interact with gravity right? It needs to hold the horse up. It needs to help the horse move. It needs to um, feel the ground, right? So it has nerves in it that help it feel where its feet are like we do, right? We don't watch our feet when we walk, right? right. We, just, we just walk. Um, and so there's a lot of different ways of creating that balance so the horse can function in as least detrimental a way as possible to itself. And because we trim the feet, we have ultimate control over how that balance is affecting the whole horse, which is, Wendy, where you and I really come together yeah. in our thought processes. You know, how, how the farrier works on the feet is going to impact everything else that you're trying to do with your riding and the horse's health and balance and really overall, overall lifespan. So... You know, we can look at all sorts of these options. There's so many options, especially when we come to therapeutic cases. So it gets really overwhelming. So, you know, to me, <laughs> sorry, this sorry. is all my workshop stuff. So to me, we, we need to have some basic understanding of balance from a hoof care provider perspective, but from a basic, you know, trim anatomy perspective, this, these feet are very dynamic and very complicated. So, you know, this is, this is a, a model of a foot and it's been um, freeze dried. Um, it was an actual leg at one point and it has all the soft tissue and you're looking at the bones of the, you know, from the ankle of the horse down, from the pastern down. And you can see that there's so many structures that come into play here. And the, my understanding from people that are a lot smarter than me is that the joint there in the middle of the foot, so let's see, since I don't have a pointer, Wendy, how would I describe that? We call that the coffin joint, right? Where the, where the foot connects to the rest of the leg. 
Yep. It um it's largely responsible for accommodating um irregularities in terrain, so uneven terrain or um going uphill to downhill. There's a lot of movement in that joint. And so that's what we try to balance around as the farrier. And we have to think about all these soft tissue structures and then all of the um all of the things we can affect on the outside that are the horny structures, the non-vascular structures, is affecting everything on the inside. So it's a big responsibility. Um, the mass that's circled in blue in the back of this foot is the digital cushion and the frog. And that acts like a cushion for the horse's foot. So it's a shock absorbing structure and it needs to be able to be healthy and engaging. It has a lot of cartilage in it when it's very healthy. And that's an important thing for horses to develop in a, um, in a sense of um, thrush and any kind of overly um, dirty environment, wet environment. In nature, horses would not poop in one place and stand in it. So, you know, unfortunately in domestication, sometimes horses are forced into that situation. So maintaining the health of the back of the foot is vitally important. And then the front of the foot has the bone in it but it also has um, you know, the wall and the sole, and that tends to run forward on us. As hoof care providers, we see toes get long. Some of you may have feet there, the toes get very distorted, and that can have balance problems for the rest of the horse, um, let alone create issues with soft tissue like long toes, um, and if the heels are too low, there's too much pressure on the back of the foot can cause things like navicular disease or navicular syndrome, if you've heard some things about that. Um, in the back of the foot, which are performance problems and lameness causing injuries. So, so I did a workshop with Bob Bowker last year and yeah. um, sort of my lay person's way of kind of thinking about some of the things that Bob was talking about is that when we have heel pain, it's kind of like a person with plantar fasciitis because right. the, our heel structure, the soft tissues are very similar to the design of the horse's frog. And right. I was so fascinated by that, that, that our heel and the horse's frog are, are such a similar, the digital cushion, such a similar design. And that's what they're supposed to do is cushion. And so, you know, I was suffering with heel pain there for um, quite a while. And when Bob talked about this, I was like, oh. <laughs> right. So you got it. Right. That really helped. Right. And yeah. then long toe, low heel, the, again, my lay person's way of thinking about it was he talked about the slipper toe and how the bone was thinning. And so for me, it equated to what older women deal with, which is osteopenia. The right. The thinning of the bone, it's weaker, it's not as strong and the potential for damage and also that the weight load isn't coming. Oh, hang on. I got to go talk to FedEx. So you keep talking, okay? Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty funny. FedEx, bad timing. So, um, so yeah, I think, I think looking at how these dynamic structures interact with the ground and whether you work on your own horse's feet or whether you have a farrier or a trimmer that comes and takes care of your horse's feet, being aware of how those structures need to support the whole horse's foot, oh, we've got the cat, is, is super important. Yeah. You still there? <laughs> oh, we're here. We were just okay. talking about we were just talking about being aware of these things, regardless of whether you take care of the horse's feet or whether um, you know you have a trimmer or a farrier that comes. You still need to be aware of what this balance, you know, sort of looks like and the health of the foot. Right. You know, it's really it's a really great way that uh, you can advocate for your horse is by being knowledgeable about these things. Right. So so this is the structures that we're dealing with that you as a farrier are trimming and trying to keep healthy and keep in good balance. And yeah. um, can you show us some pictures of some feet that are not in good balance? Oh yeah, I've got plenty of those. Yeah, so let's see here. How about, let's go down here, let's go up and down here. How about, oh, this one, yeah. That's definitely not in good balance. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's typical, unfortunately, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. It's very typical. This is that low heel, long toe. And, you know, the th things that I look at in this foot that tell me this horse is in trouble is um, looking at, if you all can see the hoof rings in the picture, those stripes that are going down the foot. Um, 
you know, they are, a horse should not have rings at all. And they really turn down sharply in the heel, in the back of that foot. And um, that's an indicator that there's a lot of stress in the back of that foot. Um, the, um, the angle of the foot is very shallow and the coronary band where the foot meets the rest of the leg is very steep. And that has a direct relationship to the angle of that bone inside the foot and it's way too low in the heel. That takes so the some coronary band then really should be more parallel to the ground? Yeah, it should be, it should be more um, closer to parallel. I mean, if it's too parallel, you've got a club foot. Okay. But okay. if it's, you know, if it's too steep, then you have, you know, a low heel situation. So there's a direct correlation between the angle of the coronary band and the angle of the bone. So that's and, like just a great simple place to look to see how your horse's foot is going. Right. And a, a great tip about coronary band angle is if you look at the hind feet, you know, we talk a lot of Wendy about how the, the, if your heels are too low behind, it causes a lot of performance problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so the way you know if your heels are too low in your hind feet is a little easier than the front because the coronary band, if you put a broom handle through the coronary band, looking at the horse from the side, that broom handle should aim at the knee of the horse or below. Oh, that's a really easy way to, to determine it. Yep. And if it aims above that, if it's at the elbow or sometimes the belly, then your heels are way too low and you should ask your farrier and your vet to help you get better angles behind. So negative plane, that's the term that's used when you've got um, that really low heel and that coronary band pointing upward? Yeah. Yeah. So let me show you this slide you'll like. And here are the distortions. So case studies. Yeah, there's just a couple things in here. Yeah. I noticed that uh, secretariat photo go by. Oh yeah, <laughs> isn't that a great one? Yeah, yeah. Talking about balance and uh, poise and performance. Okay, here we go. So this is what we're talking about. So this would be considered an ideal foot alignment. So the, the bones line up in a fairly straight line there in, in the foot. The bottom of P3, that palmar angle, the orange, that should be between five and eight degrees, ideally. And you know everything is pretty compact around that foot. But then if you get a low palmar angle or a negative, negative plane coffin bone, you can see where the bones are no longer lined up in a straight way. And the orange line on the bottom of the coffin bone there is, is too low in relation to the ground. So, and that, yeah, go ahead. So it's interesting, you like when we look at a horse's foot, we see that the, the, obviously the hoof is on the ground, but we have to kind of visualize what the bones are doing inside. Exactly. And so our clues are the angle of the coffin, uh, sorry, the angle of the coronary band and the, the line uh, the the rings on the horse's feet, and yep. then of course the line. If you cut, drop down from the coronary band to the ground, the line along the front of the foot, like that's a big clue on this foot. Right, right. It's more accurate to draw the line in the middle of the bones because they're trapezoids. But okay. even if, as a lay person, you're just trying to get a general impression, understanding that's we call that hoof pastern axis. That that should be fairly straight. And the easiest way you're going to know this, and I'm a I'm a high advocate of um, preventative radiographs. You know, if you want objective information about how to know if your horse has, you know, appropriate angles that aren't causing undue harm to the horse over time, because it's preventative. You may not have a problem right now, but you might be heading towards a problem if you don't have your angles lined up appropriately because it's putting leverage on soft tissue. Well, so, and then it gives you feedback by ha like having a record. It's like just yeah. um, having a baseline. Yeah, and then it's, you're not going to your farrier and saying, hey, I think, you know, I watched this webinar with Daisy and Wendy, and they said, you know, which the farrier always loves, right? Yeah. So, you know, instead you're saying, I just want to check in on my horse's feet and have a conversation about where, where they are now and where we're going and what we can do to help him have the best feet possible. And, you know, I'm going to get some radiographs, and I hope we can have a powwow about that. And most farriers are very willing with more information to, you know, be proactive to help you and your horse. Great. So then it's not your opinion, then it's Great. objective information, which helps.
Okay, so we've looked at the coronary band, the rings on the foot, and then just the sort of relative line off the toe. But what, when we, what happens when we pick up and look at the bottom of the foot, like the picture you have on the right there? How, how, what are we looking for when we're looking for a healthy, good foot when we pick up that foot? Yeah, so look at the difference between this foot where the frog is big and wide. It should be at least 50% as wide as it is long. Does that make sense? So the back of the frog there by the heel bulbs, if you took that length and laid it on the length of the frog towards the toe, it should at least be double, right? So like it should width be- width across the heel should be half the length, length of the foot from heel to toe. Correct, and if it's not, that means it's too narrow. Oh, okay. Right, so then you have contracture, which means the back of your foot isn't as healthy as we'd like it to be. So what about some horses that uh, tend to have more of a conical foot, like your uh, Andalusians? Yeah, so even them, um, when you look at it, they really should still, they might be boxier and straighter in the quarters and be longer and narrower, but that frog sh ratio should still work. Okay. And then, yeah. so we've got the, the width of the back of the foot and then the length of the frog relative to the overall foot. Yep. So, you know, I like to look at things based on the center of the foot, which um, for a lay person, it would take some, a little bit of studying to find. But ideally you want, you want of your whole sole length, you want 50% in the back and 50% in the front around the center. Do you have so, a, a picture that has that drawn on it? Heck yes. What? I'm, sorry, I'm talking to my cat. It's totally okay. Yeah. What do you want? So this is the idea. This is a very distorted foot, but it'll give you an idea that what we're looking at is the, the center of rotation of that entire foot is the pink circle with the pink plus sign in the radiograph. And that's the center. So you want 50% of your footprint, your sole in front of that and 50% behind. And so what this diagram is showing is that you've got 80% of your sole in front of that center and only 20% behind. So this is a horse that has a lot of toe leverage. Now he has some other problems too, but you can correlate that directly to the picture of the sole below it. And you can actually look at how the back of the foot and the back of the frog with the center, that's where the center is on the sole, and then that's where the end of his foot is. So, and I've even drawn a line for where the bone is because we can actually locate the bone in the sole as well. So you can, with a little bit of studying, you can find all those landmarks, but ideally you want, you want that balanced ratio front to back. And that's not most horses. Most horses are not trimmed or shod that way. So it's a good thing to look at. So somebody has asked, how do you find the center? Yeah, so there are five different ways to find the center. That's a really good question. And we call that hoof mapping or sole mapping. And here it is. Oh, and I've got some, some oh, that's a great illustration. Because I've got some questions here. Okay, so, and I'm happy to share this with anybody who'd like a copy. Um, however, we can get that to everybody. Um, something I have freely out on the internet and I'm happy to share it on how to do this soul mapping. So we can um, really put that when I post it, we can um, list a link on how to do that. Perfect. I love it. Thank you. So this is the step starting at the bottom with number one and going around number two, number three, we're going counterclockwise um, on how to map the foot so you know where everything is. The center, if you look at number three, there are five different ways to find the center of rotation. And um, you can look at the widest part of the foot on the outside there where the maroon line is on the, on the quarters, on the outsides like this. You can look at where that is. So you would look at the arc of the foot on the outside and where you draw a straight line this way. The last point on the arc that your straight line touches is where the widest part would be. So you can find those two points on either side. You can look at the end of the white line of the bar and the, and the bar, we call them bar swells. It's a bump that is on the, um, the coffin bone where the bars stop. And it actually has a connection point there on the bone. And you can actually feel that on the outside of the foot. And they're very reliable. Bar swells are very reliable. It takes a little bit of practice to find them, but once you've found them, you can find them on every foot. It's not hard. Cool. Um, 
And then you can look at something that's very technical called the frog boob. That's actually what Dr. Bowker talks about, where it's the, the mass of the frog that supports the navicular bone. And um, it's like a, a rounder area in the middle of the frog, and you can find that. And then on an average size foot, we do do one measurement which is one inch back from the true frog apex, but that's the one I like the least because the frog apex can run forward on you and then that misleads your eye. So, you know, there's Daisy can't, unfortunately she can't use her mouse pointer because it's in a PowerPoint. Um, Cause somebody's asked, can you use your pointer? Um, I can, I can do it this way. Hang on, watch this, let's see if I can do this. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, so now I can Oh yeah, yeah, mouse. awesome, yeah. Yeah, and if I get rid of this, let's see, watch this, doo -doo -doo. yay! Okay, so now I can use my mouse, thank you. Yep. So this is the, the yellow is the frog boob, that's the yellow. The, um, this maroon line, this is, would be where I've drawn the center. The bars are here, and that would be the end of the bars. The bar swells are here, and I have a picture of the bar swells. You wanna see what bar swells look like? Yes. That is that's a huge term to me, bar swells. Yeah. Also, Frog boob. <laughs> frog boob. I know, it's very technical. Um, the bar swells are up here. So these are the bar swells. So this is the bottom of the coffin bone. Wait, where's your pointer here? Over Over here. Oh, upper okay. right corner. Got it. Oh, yep. got it. Yep, so see bar swells in pink. Yep. So this is the bottom of the coffin bone, and then there are the, um, these protrusions here. So the white line of the bar comes in on the back of the bone here, the palmar process and it terminates here. And then in the middle is the deep digital flexor tendon comes down and attaches here to the semilunar crest, which is this big part of the bone, which where the navicular bone sits in here. And the deep digital flexor tendon goes over the navicular bone and attaches to the bottom of the coffin bone. So we're looking at the bottom of the coffin bone here, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Yep. And so um, those bar swells are, are these bumps that are these protrusions. I'll move my line so you can see it. Let's see here. See it right there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I've drawn them, but they actually exist. It's an, it's an anatomical reference attachment point on every bone. And okay. so you can actually find them. And what's neat about them is that when you um, look at where this is, those bar swells are gonna be right under that center of rotation if you're looking at the side of this bone. Wow. So it's right under the center. So bar swells are probably your most reliable landmark. Um, and you wanna feel them by taking your thumbs if you're looking at your horse's sole, take your thumbs in the grooves on either side of the frog, the collateral grooves, and start at the back and just run your thumbs forward. And you're going to feel at the base of the collateral groove, the bottom, you're going to feel a bump. And when you hit that, that's your bar swell. Wow. How cool is that? Yeah. I love it. See, makes uh, my job easier because I can know where my anatomy is. So, so we have a couple of questions about trimming, but I think what we're going to do um, is trimming and gets into kind of technical stuff that for today, we're just kind of doing some landmarks and we want to look at some pictures of horses standing on surefoot pads. Um, yeah. But, you know, I'm sure that these folks can ask, ask you questions afterward or get in touch with you or um, yeah. we'll talk about your online courses and that sort of thing. But I think for today, we're just trying to kind of make sure everybody's up to speed on, on the basic structures of the foot and balance and what we're looking for there and we can we can always do more later sure absolutely okay so can you go back to that other diagram you had where we you talked yeah. about the bar swells yeah the mapping yep. yeah right here yep let's see i know somebody else had a question here while i was up i think we've answered it okay yeah, somebody said when you say th say length, are you saying length from foot of or frog? Length of foot. So you want fifty percent in the back to the center and fifty percent towards the toe. So you know this is what the mapping looks like. You want to look at that. Oh, cool. Or like this. See fifty fifty that way. Yep. And like this. This one just an example that we did, we mapped it and then we um, trimmed it. And this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to put the bone in our head. Now this bone's upside down on the foot, right? This doesn't belong in this foot, it's just an example. But that's where the bone lies inside the foot. 
and then just flipped the other way. And then this is kind of how you want to trim to get everything tightly compact around the bone. So like you don't want to wear a foot on your sh a shoe on your foot that's too big. And right. you don't want the horse to have to deal with a hoof that's too big compared to the internal anatomy. Can you get the foot too small? Not without bleeding the horse. Okay. <laughs> no, personally, I believe that, you know, if we're looking at leverage on soft tissue and, the, and that joint, to me, the more we reduce the leverage, the less wear and tear and compensation the horse has over time. So I think the foot should be tightly compact around the bone and the bone is the size and shape it is. So if you have it in that harmonious location, that's, that's what the horse has. And building a bigger foot is only gonna get you other problems later in the horse's life and performance career. Okay, so, so what I'd like to do is um, have you unshare your screen for a minute. Sure. And I'm gonna share the screen and show some pictures of horses on surefoot pads. Okay. Or, or pictures of horses that have been on surefoot pads. Okay. Right. And so um, the beauty of the surefoot pad is that it can um, leave the impression of how the horse is loading. And so we get to see sort of a picture that we wouldn't normally see because when a horse is in good footing, and this is the thing is, um, you know, people spend thousands and thousands of dollars on good footing, but when they're in good footing, you don't see how the foot's actually landing on the hard surface. You, you cause it goes through the top cushion and then you can't really see what's going on. And when a horse is on a hard surface, the hoof capsule is going to stop because it's hit friction and it's slowed down, but you can get movement of the internal structures. And so the, the beauty of the surefoot pads is that you can put a horse on a surefoot pad and when you step them off, you can see how they've been loading their foot. And so this is one daisy that I use quite a bit. It's a shod horse, but yeah. the, and the reason I use this one is that we actually see this really nice frog. Huh. Yeah. And yeah, there's so many times where I've had a horse on a pad and I don't see a frog. So, so what is that saying when we don't see a frog? Well, it means that it's not getting engagement, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not connecting to a deformable surface readily. Which and so how important is it that a horse's frog make contact with the ground? Critical. Yeah, because that frog is gonna, I'm gonna see if I can find some pictures of when I don't have a frog. Yeah. yeah I have one there. Um, I've seen times when there's like the absolutely no frog presence at all. So here's one actually, and you yeah. can see that, the, and this is a soft pad, which is gonna give the most and make the most contact. And yeah. we just barely see a little bit of heel there. And really we don't see any frog impression whatsoever. Right. Yeah, that to me would be way less than ideal. I mean, that frog and digital cushion is so integral into the shock and concussion absorbing system of the foot that when it atrophies, Dr. Bowker talks about how the fibrocartilage in the digital cushion atrophies when it's not engaged well. And once those, that cartilage is gone, you don't get it back. So your digital cushion should be cartilagin cartilaginous, like your nose, <laughs> thank you, like your nose. So it should feel like this. And when that cartilage atrophies, then it ends up feeling like your earlobe. And it's oh, wow. not, right, and it's not as resilient and it's, and it's too spongy and it doesn't, it doesn't give the um, shock and concussion absorbing and management system that it's supposed to. And so guess what happens to all the force that's going into that foot in the back of the foot? It goes right into the navicular bone. Wow, so that could set that up for heel pain and all kinds of other things. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, just, just talk briefly about, in terms of the mapping you've talked about, aside from the fact that we're not seeing a frog, what, what do you think the overall balance of this foot is like? Well, let's see, I mean, Looking at it, um, it's a little bit hard for me to see exactly three-dimensionally where it's loading the most. It looks like it's loading harder on the left side of my screen. Yeah. Is that what was happening? Or the right side? This, this side here? Or where the dirt is? Where the dirt is. Yeah. Oh, this side. Yep. Yeah. But I, what I was kind of looking at is, is how narrow this is back here well, right. compared to the width. Right. Yeah. And you don't want those heels to be narrower than the toe. Yeah. Exactly. Um, because then remember we were talking about the width and length of the frog, that's most likely meaning that you have a contracted 
heals and contracted frog, which means again, the back of that foot suffering. And so he, here's a, just another print. Obviously I didn't take the dirt off of it. I can, I can actually turn it a bit so it's organized. So we're looking at it. Mm -hmm. Where that so one's very wide. About that foot? Yeah, that foot's very wide, huge frog. Yep, so this is our frog impression all the way through here. Yeah. Yep. Hind foot. But it's kind of interesting because we don't see a really symmetrical outer part of the foot. Right. Big flare on the outside. This one right here. Yeah. Yep. yep. And, and what about, flare. is that also a flare on the other that's side? A huge flare. Yeah, that's a huge flare. So you've got that's a heel flare quarter flare. Sides. Yeah. But differently. I'm trying to, that's not the horse. Yeah. I'm, I'm hoping, I think I have some pictures where we can actually see the horse and, um, and see and the look the pad. Oh, I have, I have a really interesting one. I'm going to go to this one. So I had a little quarter horse come to, um, sorry, I'm going to make everybody dizzy. This little quarter horse came for a lesson. And this was how the right front was standing when we started. Hmm. Okay. And so then I did the left front. And I'll just get, and this is how the left front was. And then I used the pads, uh, a couple of times, like had the horse move off in between and come back, right? But this was both front feet. Where's my after picture? And then this is after. Huh. Really interesting. Yeah. So what is your impression going on there? Like, what do you think's happening? Well, it seemed like initially the horse was loading its heels because there was a little more like frog impression if I can find both feet here again. Yeah. But the pads are different hardnesses as well. No, these pads different? were both the same hardness. This is both the hard pad, but I just flipped it over and used the other side because it hadn't sprung back from this impression. So when I flipped okay. it over, it's, it's just an ivory color. And so I just uh, used the pad. Okay, same pad then. Okay. Yep. Cool. It was so fascinating to me because we were all watching this horse and she, she was super base narrow, right? Mm -hmm. And she was really low in front mm -hmm. and she was really low in her chest on this side. And I'll just play a little bit of that video so you can just see how she was so low on her chest. But what surprised us was how much change we saw in the, in the impression after like maybe 15 minutes of just using the pads. And that's when we got this impression. So this is just flipping the pad over and we see yep. an entirely different foot. Totally different. And if I had shown you those two pictures, would you have thought it was the same horse? No. Yeah. So no. you've been using Surefoot for how long now? Since you first came out with it. So that's what, how many years now? Well, 2012 was when I first started. So you yeah, me, so yes, that's that. right. <laughs> you've been there since the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your experience with Surefoot and how you've seen it help help you and help you with your work? Yeah, I mean, it's been fantastic for us. Um, we use them for two different purposes. The first way we use them is just very linear and it's honestly to help the horses be more comfortable when they're standing if they're sore. Um, and so we have the individual pads and then we also have the double pad, the farrier pad. The farrier pad, yep. Yep, and so we'll use them differently. So the farrier pad, we'll put under both front feet or both hind feet if the horse is sore standing on one end, one side or the other or under one foot or not. And that's just more about comfort and we're not looking specifically about, you know, how the horse is loading. Although it's very interesting to see when we're talking about balance considerations this way, so what we'll do, the other way we use the pads is we'll put Share the horse- Share my screen there you go, keep going. Okay. So the other way we'll use the pads is we'll put the pads under the horse's feet and let them stand there for 10 or 15 minutes and you know do something while they're ruminating and then we look at how they loaded the pad as to checking our thought process on what we're doing with the hoof balance so when i think to myself i think this horse um wants more heel and i want to leave him heel i'll put him on the pads and see does he actually go to his toe in the pad and if he goes to his toe, that's telling me that he's finding a place that is neutral for him at this moment in time where he wants to be a little more upright. 
and that might affect my trim and my shoeing balance that I that I do with that horse. Um, especially and so you use it before you actually start your trim. Yeah. Cool. Oh, yeah. All the time. Um, it's tons of information. Horses that um, have medial lateral imbalance problems, we'll put them on the pads and see, you know, what do they create for themselves? Because if you think about it, the pad is exactly what we can do for the horse um, in our trim and our shoeing in terms of filling negative space. So what we're affecting is balance this way and this way, right? So, so if, if they load their pad with the toe and say the outside down, then they are potentially looking for more foot on the medial side and the heel because this is where they go. Now that can change, so you have to recheck it. So we might do a trim balance change and then put them back on the pads and see if they're more loading more neutrally on the pads. And usually it works out where we can use that as a, as a trim or shoeing um, double check for what, what our plan is. Give the horse a voice. So, so you're actually, do you use it like as you're trimming and then you put them back on the pad and see how the foot's changing? Yeah. So cool. So you can kind of use it like during the whole process then. Yes. Well, and especially when I saw how much that horse changed in 15 minutes when I, you know, like that just, I had a, there was a bunch of us standing around and our minds were blown when we saw that because I, I had never actually seen a horse with such a discrete shape go to such another shape in, in that period of time. Yeah. Um, so that really started to make me think about when you're trimming or shoeing, that giving the horse that opportunity to normalize that foot on a pad that's going to give to the pressure is just a, a great way to use the pads during the process of working. Yeah. And it actually gives us information about where to go. Right. And, I mean, horses stand on deformable footing and uneven surfaces all the time. So I know that if I make a change, it's not static for the horse. Like it doesn't just maintain that way. But so many of the horses I deal with are dealing with soft tissue injury or strain in their coffin joint. Um, you know, there's layers and layers of ligaments um, and tendons all around those joints in the distal limb in the bottom of the horse's leg. So, you know, we spend a lot of our time figuring out how can we trim and shoe them to reduce leverage. And the pads help me do that. That's really cool. So what's the other way that you use them? Just uh, sorry for the general comfort. So like, you know, this horse has to stand on one foot that's uncomfortable and we'll put the pads, you know, under a foot, different densities. You know, some horses like it softer or harder, especially my laminitic horses. You know, what do you use most with your laminitic horses? I get that question a lot. You know, it honestly depends because some of them like a firmer pad and some of them like a soft pad. Depends, it depends if the pain is in the lamini or in the wall or in the sole. Oh, okay. If the pain is in the sole, they don't like a soft pad. They want a hard pad. Okay. And That's if the pain really good information. And if the pain is in the wall, then they like a soft pad. Okay. Because this is a question that I get all the time is, and especially now that we're coming into the spring season, yeah. you know, um, horses are, are the, I mean, I don't know about you, but when I look out in my yard, the grass is so green all of a sudden. And so I'm already starting to get these questions about laminitic horses. And so, yes. so the, then if it's, if it's in the, say it again, if it's in the middle of the foot. If the pain is in, in the sole, yep. then they want a hard pad. Okay. Because what they don't want is they don't want the, the soft pad pressing up on the sole. Ah, okay. So they want something that's a little more firm. Got it. And then if the pain is in the wall, standing on something firm is gonna load the wall more. So they like the soft so that they can share the load to the sole and the frog and the other structures. Wow, that's really important. Um, and then um, the other pad that I've used, like Joyce's horse had a little bout, she's always been a little, a little, um, IR. And yeah. so she started to have a little bit of laminitis and we, she wanted the slants, the firm slants. And she wound up standing on firm slants for an hour a night. She wasn't yeah. swaying so we could leave her. Right. But Good. she just stood on those slants. So have you used the slants much with your laminated courses? I have, I have actually. And there are definitely some like, um, when they get, um, you know, there's a whole debate about the tendon involvement in laminitis and what I do know is when horses have foot pain, and you know about this, Wendy, they, they cringe, right? Like they just kind of like shorten everything and go into flexor withdrawal. So, so when they're in that place, if we ask them to stand on, on their feet, 
like as they are barefoot, sometimes that's too much stretching out for them and they get uncomfortable, they get painful from that. So if you put them on the slant and you raise their heel up, it allows them to relax into a place that's not stretching the tendon muscle apparatus and the shoulders and the withers as much and you can keep them more comfortable and potentially prevent um, further damage to the lamini and laminitis. Wow, okay, because that's a lot of times I'll recommend the slants for laminated courses because I've seen that they really like it. Um, I have a number of vets that I know that they're, um, they're a little afraid of the slants actually, <laughs> but oh. I think they work great. Yeah, well, they're not familiar with it, right? So, yeah. um, oh, do I have a picture of Farrier Pad? Yes, I absolutely have a picture. Of, I found it, um, actually, yeah. While you look for that, can I make another comment about slants? Go for it. So we love using the slants on hind feet. Yes, I do that all the time. Tell me why you like using slants on hind feet. Well, right. So most of our horses on the hinds, yep, there's the farrier pad. Yep. I love it. And it's big enough to have two feet on. So it's a little tricky sometimes getting both feet. Sometimes you put one foot forward, then the other. Sometimes you step them onto it, and sometimes you back them onto it. But once they start to figure it out, a lot of horses will just step right onto it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so the slants on the hind feet with the wedge at the back, right? So what it does a lot of our horses are too low in the heel behind like we talked about the coronary band angle being too steep that's very common in our horses so what it does is it raises the heel angle for them and they can bring their cannon bones and their legs further back in the hind and they can stand much more comfortably to balance if you're working with their front feet so you actually use the slants while you're working on the front feet right Cool. So this horse here is on a full physio pad in front with the, the uh, hard slants behind. The physio pad is an inch of hard and a half inch of medium. And then the hard is, uh, the slants are a three inch block cut on an angle. So you wind up with the, with the um, angled pad. And you can see where, you know, this horse here is very happy to stand on that full physio pad and with her slants behind. And she's doing a little bit of swaying, not a lot of swaying, but just a tiny bit if you watch her chest. So, um, so what recommendations do you have for people? You know, we are, I'm going to stop sharing for a second and just find some more pictures. You know, we're coming into spring, and of course, the the biggest issue right now is that we're stuck at home when we can't exercise our horses. Uh, not everybody can get to the barn, and you know, we've got uh, grass coming in. Yeah. What can you recommend to people? Anything? About exercise or about? Well, you know, I mean, some of them can get to the barn. I mean, the, everybody's in different lockdown situations and it's varying country to country. And so I suppose in some ways it's good if horses are not getting just randomly turned out on grass right now. Um, oh, because of like spring laminitis and things like that. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, this is a really dangerous time of year for most of us um, when it's, you know, above well 40 degrees fahrenheit during the day and below 40 degrees fahrenheit at night the grass is the highest in sugar yeah. and it's just coming out of hibernation from the winter and so i think we need to be really careful about horses on turnout um especially any horse that has a risk of laminitis or has had laminitis in the past so the sugar in the grass is lowest first thing in the morning until about 10 a.m and, and overnight after about 10 p.m um, so you can try turn out early in the morning and then bring them in, limit the time, try grazing muzzles, um, and then just really watch your horse's body condition. You know, look for, um, you don't want them to have any crest or fat pads on their shoulders or their hind end. Um, you don't want them to have a, a channel down the back or the fat pads above their eyes. All those are signs that your horse is obese or has, is laying an, an unhealthy layer of fat down that would be related to potential um, metabolic problems. So if you see your horse is getting fat or is already fat, then I would say no grass until summer because right. it's just too high in sugar right now. So we've got a couple of questions. And yeah. um, like one of them is, have you noticed change over time with horses' feet using surefoot pads? Do you have any clients that are using it regularly that you know of? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, what we see is that the horse 
the horses find their center much more easily and the wear and tear in their body is much less, which means that their feet are going to grow in a less distorted manner. So the clients that use short foot pads regularly, I see that their feet, feet stay more um, ideal, less distorted. The horses stand more square and don't have abnormal posture nearly as much as the ones that don't use short foot pads. And it's easier for me to maintain the feet. Plus just the way we use them practically in our, in our um, like daily work as the farrier, it's great to be able to have a high strung horse. You can put your horse on the short foot pads um, and the horse, you know, will, will relax and, and kind of plug into um, what's going on with their balance and their, their nervous system. And it must, it's much easier to work on them. So those owners are great because that benefits us as farriers a lot. Just yeah, that's, um, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody uh, tell me a story about the horse that had to be tranquilized for the farrier and they use sure foot pads a couple of times and they don't have to tranquilize the horse anymore. And right. you know, your job is, is dangerous enough, just physically hard that yeah. if people would use sure foot pads to get their horses more balanced and, and more comfortable and familiar so that when you come along, you have less, you know, your life is easier. That's right. Yeah. I can do a better job if my horse stands quietly. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I'm just trying to look and see. We have um, I, so a couple of people have asked about the broom handle coronet band. Again, can you go over that again? Yeah, no problem. So if you're looking from the side of the horse at the back feet and you put that broom handle or any straight line, a yardstick, anything straight, you know, a whip through the, put it parallel to the angle of the coronary band. And usually what you have to do is you have to put it there and then have someone else stand back or have someone hold it and you stand back and look at where it's pointing. And if it points at the knee or below, then your coffin bone is at a good angle, a positive angle. And if it points above the knee or heaven forbid at the elbow or the belly, I had one horse where the coronary band angle pointed at the sheath, that was awful, like this. Um, that's telling you that your heels are too low and that um, the horse is going to end up with hind end wear and tear issues. Wow. Frightening. Yeah. And it's something we can do something about. We just have to be able to recognize it and then, you know, advocate with our team. Right. So there's another question that should the coronary, ba coronary band angle match in front and in back? Not necessarily. The, the way you know that the angle is accurate is if you have a straight hoof pasture and axis. Um, can I go back to a slide one moment? Yeah, go for it. Okay. Let me just go back to this. Let's see here. Go to screen share. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you guys see that now? Uh, all we see is that you started screen sharing, but we can't see it. We can't see it. That's weird. I wonder why. So, is paused. so stop it. it and then okay. make sure that you pick the right screen to share. Okay. Because when you start it, you'll get a window with a couple of boxes. Okay. Make sure you pick the right box. There you go. Does that work? Yep. Okay. So if we, if we look at, um, let's see, which is the one I wanted. Hind feet. That's not the right one. Which one? Are, what are you seeing right now? Picture I'm of a horse. seeing a screen with a horse under saddle. It says Coast Hoof Care Providers. Oh, yeah. from the fall. <laughs> okay, there it is. Okay, okay. Oh. Now, are you, now are you seeing a mapped foot? Yep. Great. Okay. Sorry, I had to go. It, I wasn't seeing it. Okay. Um, so if you look at a horse standing from the side, if you look at this horse, see where this where these this coronary band is aiming. Yeah. Right. It's going, it's going like to the knee, right? So that one's, that one's sort of okay. Except for how he's at, standing in front. Well, yeah, he's not standing well, but his angles are okay. Now this is an awkward angle, but look where this angle's pointing. Look how much steeper that is. It's going all the way up here. Yep. And if we really got to the side of him, I bet you that this is actually aiming up more like at his elbow. Right. Um, where if you look here, look at this horse. Oh, wow. Where that angle, Oops, did you just lose your audio? Daisy? Did we just lose Daisy? 
Sí, sí. Uh-uh. Okay, let me get back to the chat. Yep, I lost. Oh, you're back. Okay, that was weird. I couldn't cool. see you guys either. Just disappeared yeah, we, there. We lost everything. Okay, you're oh. back. Yay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Okay. So, you know, so you can see that, that that angle is pretty easy to spot. Right. That's right. Very cool. All right. So um, let's see. What's one last thing we want to talk about here? We, have a, we just have a few minutes left. So, so I guess as, as a home horse owner, like the things that they can do to actually help their horse is to do things that are going to like pay attention to their hoof angle, have conversations with their farrier or barefoot trimmer, and yeah. use surefoot pads to keep what i've seen is i've had people that have used surefoot pads over time and the horse's foot literally changes shape right because you're changing the load and and we keep right. having to go back to gravity and the idea that you've got the load of the horse coming down into the foot and the more balanced the foot is then the better the, the alignment's going to be and the less stress there's going to be on all the structures exactly and so this idea of being able to to look at the horse's foot and map it out so that we can see what what the shape is that 50 50 shape and find those landmarks and look at that cough um that coffin uh sorry coronary band coronary band hairline then we can start to actually have some um what's the word you know um awareness awareness but we can start to take charge a little bit of our own horse's foot health because we can start to see if things are changing and yeah. Um, have that conversation with our farrier or with our vet or with our barefoot trimmer and yeah. be proactive. Yeah. Ask for radiographs. Oh yeah. Radiographs. That's right. Yeah. Radiographs are great. Once a year. Oh, okay. Kind of like going to the dentist and getting x-rays. Get your vaccines, get your, if you do vaccines, get your, you know, get your overall wellness check from your vet and do your radiographs, you know? So um, somebody's just made a comment that they've been trying to research this information and it's been really confusing and that you've explained things clearly. So if people want more information, Daisy, where can they go? Oh, I'm so excited about all this. You know, um, so I teach workshops, you know, all over. And right now, you know, we can't um, get together in groups. Right. So we're relying on social media and the internet. And so since I am not traveling, I have time to actually put a lot of this information online. Awesome. So I have, thank you. Yeah, I'm excited about it because I've wanted to do this for a while. I have two Patreons. Um, What's one, a Patreon? Patreon is a blog that's a subscription blog where you pay a low monthly fee and you have access to um, posts and videos and, and content that I upload. Okay. And so one of them is um, my personal one under Daisy Bicking. And you would just go to Patreon, which is www.patreon.com and search for me. And that one is on my personal work. It's a little more advanced level. It's on case studies and also how-to videos of the horses that I work on on a daily basis. And then the other one that I just started is um, for beginning trimming. Somebody wants you to slow down. <laughs> Sorry. I'm excited. <laughs> so um you can you put this information in your when you post the video too yeah actually i can put a lot of description into the video comments so um so there's patreon and you have your your private one and then you have one for daisy haven farm right right so i'm putting them in the chat how's that oh perfect yeah so you guys can have them and um the one that's for my school is for is the beginning is a beginning trimming course it's 12 modules with lots of lessons in each module and you can subscribe to one module at a time as fast or as slow as you want go at your own pace and i'm available to answer questions and for mentorships and it's so just Daisy, i mean so many people are like afraid to try to trim their horse themselves because they don't want to make a mistake and i got forced into it because uh, it's a very long story, but basically my farrier put a nail through my horse's sole of his foot and we didn't know, he didn't abscess, remember Andy? And finally, 
I couldn't get anybody to take the shoe off. And finally we got the shoe off and that was when I tried somebody else and I was done. And so right. that's when we started doing it and I said, yeah. and you helped me. And so I was forced into it because uh, I couldn't deal with what was happening to my horse and I couldn't find anybody. But right. you know, I'm hoping that people realize that, um, that there's a lot of information that you have available so people can start to learn how to do this themselves. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I started with my horse that was super sore and he had four different feet and I was, you know, always struggling to find to figure out what a good foot was. But I'm wondering if your online course is something that the average horse owner whose horse is barefoot could actually start to work with to figure out how to do this. That's the goal. The goal is that it's going to be a course that will take a new person to hoof care from start to finish on a maintenance trim on a fairly good footed horse. And if that's not what you have, I wanna have tips and tricks for you on how to get appropriate help for those things as well. And you can still be empowered to take care of your horse's feet. You just might need a little bit more help and input to get you to a maintenance place. And are there resources where people can find trimmers that study with you in their area? Yeah, um, basically I'd ask people to contact me directly and I can tell them who in the area um, I can recommend. And how can they get in touch with you? Um, you can contact me through Facebook at okay. Daisy Alexis Bicking um, or through my... Oops. Oops. Just disappeared. She just totally disappeared. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, I can get back to my screen. Where am I? Two, two, two. Participants. Okay, so folks, I think I'm still out there. I just have to find me. Let's see. Let me get my screen up. There we go. Post. Two, two, two. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Daisy's computer died, so we'll just post the information of how you can get in touch with her. Um, I think it died while it was on her screen, so I'm not even sure how to get back to my screen. Um, but thank you all for joining us. And tomorrow I'm going to do an intro to Surefoot. So anybody who's curious about how to get started with Surefoot, it's at one o'clock tomorrow. And I hope to see you there. And thank you all for joining us. And have a great day. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>